problem with hatred and love, it does not and cannot see. Reading Jane Austen begins with a cut, turns one back into the Freudian. First a dusting of snow, then a light rain, no minimal way to hide our disappointments. From ingrained tracks and tendencies, pattern, recognition, and windblown grass. Okay, I'm gonna start. We're okay. So, so. Uh, I'm just gonna say welcome to William Blake Live. It's kind of a weird name for it, yay. Um, so we're, we're doing a series of weekly Zoom video chats um, and I thank uh, Romantic Circles Pedagogies for sponsoring it. Um, thanks, Dave. Do you, do you go by Dave ever? <laughs> okay. David um, is fine. I think Dave is like a surfer or something like that. Yeah, it's like, like a Dave, you know. It's, What's it's wrong like, with being um, a surfer? Nothing. I, I mean, uh, except they beat me up when I was little. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Every, time, so, really. <laughs> every time somebody calls me Raj, I feel like a like a like a frat boy. Yeah. Like, oh, go get the keg, Raj. <laughs> um. Anyway, I'm Roger Whitson, associate professor of English at Washington State University. I also teach in the digital technology and culture program. Um. So, and I'm a longtime William Blake scholar. Um, so, uh, today we are talking to Claire Colebrook, who is the Edwin L. Sparks Professor of English at Penn State University. Um, your most recent book was Death of the Posthuman, or have you written a Correct. book? Correct. I've, I've got one in press now on fragility, but okay. that's the, yeah, that's open access. For Love, that. Love the open access. Gotta go open access. All about it. Um, she's also done a lot of work with William Blake, and uh, I want to read this section from uh, an essay she did uh, for Elizabeth Effinger and Chris Bundock's William Blake's Gothic Imagination on the Gothic Sublime. Um, and I think it's really, I think it, it may play out in, perhaps in some ways in our discussion today, um, but she has this amazing piece where she contrasts the Kantian sublime, um, in which God sort of is the only entity that has, you know, infinite perception and human beings are necessarily finite, though it can, can, can like sort of play around with that finitude. Uh, she, she contrasts that with a kind of Spinozan Leibniz sublime that you can find in William Blake's piece where, uh, where, where, the world expresses itself in every event of perception. So she says, quote, the blade of grass, the flea, the gnat, the infant, all have some perception of the infinite, but one would need to be expanded, uh, one that would need to be expanded to arrive at the fullness of godlike intuition. Another sort of sublime is possible, one that is not felt or thought at the limits of experience, but is perceived with expanded perception. Yet the sublime requires a different mode of writing to release the multiplicity of perceptions that in all their small differences make up the expressive rather than the merely intimated infinite. And I like that idea of a kind of expressive infinite. Um, so um, welcome and Claire. And I thought we could start just like, like in a simple way to have, getting you to talk about maybe William Blake and, and how you came to uh, know Blake and what Blake means to you. Um, okay, thank you. I'd completely forgotten about that essay for that incredibly awesome collection and well edited, I might add, um, of which my essay is possibly the least exciting contribution, um, which you will only find out if you get the book as a whole, isn't that right? Um, so, uh, Blake, um, why I'm interested in it now is precisely because it's unreadable. So I've been battling with it my entire life to try and make sense of it. And um, I wrote a PhD on Milton and Blake and Milton is of course incredibly readable. Everything forms a coherent system, you know. Um, but Blake, I really, really struggle to make it fit. And either 
Um, so when I tried to make a, a book out of it, you either end up with Milton one, Blake nil, because Milton makes sense and Blake doesn't, or the other, like uh, Milton zero, because it's basically logic and reason, and Blake one, um, because it has this unreadable or unassimilable component. And on the one hand, I think that's because Blake is an outlier. He makes a lot less sense immediately than the other romantics. But I think it's actually offers um, a better way of reading so that instead of um, thinking that we have to make it as coherent as the others, maybe the best way is to read other texts the way we read Blake and think that they're always in conflict with themselves, they're at war with themselves, um, they're desperately trying to piece something together, but the very moment you write something, you're not in control of it, right? So I think, and I think that's probably what's most unique about Blake, but I think it's what offers itself as a form of reading, like the materiality of writing and poetry. Um, you're not in control of, <laughs> you're not in control of what you say would be, <laughs> let's say my opening there and might help us with this discussion. I, I absolutely identify with that. Um, and it's so fascinating. I kind of want to drill down on that because um, it's both, it's something that's scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm frightened by like the fact that like I've spent you know, half my life reading books, and a lot of them are hard books. They're not easy books, right? Yeah. Um, I often feel like I can at least um, create a kind of coherent perspective on them and have something to say about them. Um, and especially, and I think this is partly why I always struggle with, you know, teaching Blake. I am always nervous I'm always nervous of getting into that class. And, and a lot of people will say like, oh, you just need to admit that you don't understand it either. And I've been writing about Blake for a decade, right? Like, and so like, I'm always nervous getting into that class and getting to the middle of it and being completely, completely lost. Like not even like yeah. a lost, like, you know? Uh, you, don't, you don't know who is actually, that some student asks you about a line and you think, wait a minute, is that, <laughs> is that Satan? Which, in which case it's bad. Is it low? In which case I'd put a plus sign on it. Um, is it a quotation with it? And I think um, then when you look at more coherent, like romantic texts, like take something like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, that's a clearly framed narrative that seems to be very Manichaean in its values, that seems to have a moral narrative. I think the same things apply. Stage one to teach it to your undergraduate students is you give them the arc of the problem, right? That what looks like a good and evil opposition is definitely there. But then when you watch it play out, <laughs> um, that really moralistic binary uh, falls apart. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, particularly, maybe getting back to um, the section I chose, um, there's a really fraught relationship in Blake with sexual difference, right? And you can want to be a feminist and smuggle him into heaven, right? And there are those books, right? Um, those ten or those articles, and I've contributed to that, right? So Blake is sort of loose irrigore for the 18th century. There's another where it's just repeating these sort of cliches. Mm -hmm. um, and neither one of those is satisfactory. It's as though what you've got in Blake is an inherited amount of textual memory that he's getting from Milton and the Bible, right? Um, his desperate attempt to redeem it, right? To give it another body. And it fails. Of course, it has to fail because you can't take the Bible and Milton and then add Blake and end up with redemption, right? That doesn't work that way. He's not a form of um, poetic Clorox, right? That will give you a, a sanitized literary tradition. So I think that's now, um, I think you have to be middle-aged as I am to admit that there's something in Blake that can't be moralized, right? And that can't be uh, redeemed and that's okay. Yeah, right. I, I definitely think poetic Clorox is a metaphor for our time. Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. Um, 
I think, um, yeah, it's like uh, this weird infection. There's a there's a lot of infection, right? Like in Blake, and there's 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 a lot of like, I don't know. I I'm I'm I always go back to the image of uh, Milton entering Blake through the foot, oh, right? And the, and there's so many um, sandals. Lust puts the sandal on his head. Then there's walking, right? And if you go back to um, if the doors of perception were cleansed. So Blake is getting out of the brain and into the foot because it's a, you walk through a door, right? You look through a window, but you walk through a door. And there's so much in Milton that instead of inspiration coming in through the, the brain, I mean, the, if we put good and evil values in Milton, the brain is never a, a in Blake, not Milton. The brain is never a good object in, <laughs> in uh Blake, right? The brain is something that imprisons you. You're locked down yeah. into your brain, right? Um, your brain is your skull. It's what gives you this bad form of interiority. Your foot seems to be something that will allow you to escape yourself, right? You can walk, right? Um, yes, I don't know. How did we get onto feet? Because oh, of Milton, Milton, Milton entering, no, yeah. To the, yeah. Yeah, and you were talking about infection, and I think that 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 model of inspiration going through your brain and you think of um uh sing heavenly muse that form of female to male inspiration is one that one is fully in command of right it's a good form of sexual difference where the female other is fruitful productive and complementary and there are all these moments in Blake like entering <laughs> entering your foot but lost you, you know the line uh he became what he beheld yeah. or you know something separates from you and then grows a spine <laughs> and um it's contamination infection um but also replication right yeah yeah i i you know one of the crazy like thoughts that i had when i first started reading blake and i don't I don't know if this is just something that his work inspired in me or infected in me, but um, was like this idea of, uh, you know, what if our brains, like I'm thinking of like our brain as like this colonizer of the body, right? Like where the body is like a, a whole bunch of different actors, like bones and sinews and like yeah. blood and like, they're all like entities or organisms, right? Of their own. And somehow the brain, either ideologically, imaginatively, or biologically, like at some point in our evolution, like just kind of took over. Or, or <laughs> perhaps, this was what I was thinking, looking at this again, you know, there's um, a phrase by Stiegler, Stiegler, organology, right? That we learn to, the eyes look out to hold a private book, right? And you think of now, how we're folded in around private screens, right? And the eyes become um, two little outlook outlooks. You know, the hand is organized to the eye so that our thumb is sweeping a little, <laughs> you know, small yeah. screen. And there's a phrase, um, you know, the Deleuze uses in the same tradition, privatization of the organs, privatization of the organs. That, well, Deleuze and Guattari, but we, we never worry about Guattari. It's, that's so, so such an awesome rant. So, and I think that when you look at these moments in Blake and the brain, it's not just that the brain is a colonizer, it organizes the body. So mm -hmm. um, the eyes only then become something that allows the hand to touch and grab and hold. And you don't have um, this redeemed body in which there's, you know, something like touch would be freed from the desire of the eye or um so i think that fourfold body in in blake which is redeemed is a sort of disaggregated body i mean there's you know but yeah so the brain is both a colonizer but i think it's more like a a cartesian brain it looks out so that your body just becomes this shell right yeah. and your organs just become instrumental right they become um subservient to a sort of reasoning logic um, right yeah chinks of the cavern chinks, chinks of the cavern yes little orbs right that um, one looks out through um 
as opposed to, I guess, getting back to uh, this section of Blake um, and Blake's Milton, the redeemed body also has, it has this opening outwards, right? But I think what's also interesting is it has garments, right? So it's um, a supplemented body. So yeah, Blake's body is a naked, right? But um, as every art critic knows, uh, there's a difference between a nude and a naked body, right? And the naked body is already, you know, the, the notion of delineation or garments or weaving so that you're, um, let's say if we at least provisionally think of the way um, some of the bodies in Blake's Milton work, some of them are like um, nervous, right? It's a brain in a central nervous system. It's, it's a colonizing brain, but others are multiple. They're clothed, right? Um, they're moving outward. Um, they're fourfold, right? There's not a single center of command. I mean, at least initially. Yeah. I'm thinking of the image of, uh, in the book of yours and of that, uh, uh, that body that's reaching up, right? But is kind of yeah. held down by this kind of slimy, yes, um, fold kind of fabric, right? And the slimy, uh, the slimy is interesting, even if that's there's. I think one of the problematic things. So we're talking about what's cool, right? About Blake, <laughs> right? That it's anti-Cartesian, yeah, yeah. Um, and that it seems to um have a more Nietzschean quality of a, a body that's like gets drunk and celebrates and dances and walks right that's the sort of cool um part but there's this other element and this is where I think what's interesting about Blake it's almost um a way of diagnosing those things that we too readily think of as redemptive right so the, you have that moral opposition in Blake between the, the nervous Cartesian uh, cavern body, right? And then there's this differentiated, delineated, molded, garment covered body. And it seems, here's what I've been uh, interested in lately. It privileges the differentiated, the delineated, um, the distinct, and, and one of the evil words in Blake, right? You said slimy, right? You could add mm. um, uh, hermaphroditic, right? Um, uh, lacking form, right? Um, dr the druidic non-proportion, right? So he has this whole aesthetic about marking, tracing, differentiating. And there's this horror, right, of just to put it into the 21st century, there's this horror of the non-binary, right? Um, the indistinct, right? Um, and in, in part, I think what's interesting about um, Milton, the poem, um, is on the one hand, Blake is, is sort of struggling to get rid of this um, Christian moral, right, notion of male, female, right, and trying to have something that's more like male, female as productive and relational. But what you get is this subterranean moralism, right, of things that are indistinct or undifferent, undifferentiated, right? Yeah. And I don't think that's an accident. I don't think you can say that's just Blake, right? I think that comes in with a whole uh, romantic tradition that's going to celebrate some redemptive form of, of sexual difference, right? So that you have a, maybe you have a, a, a tradition that runs from Milton's Paradise Lost, where Adam and Eve have this complementary conversational sexual difference, right? Up through Blake into figures like Lucy Rigoret, right? That it's a romantic tr tradition that can't cope with something that's sexually undifferentiated. Hmm. Uh, and I think that comes out in this section of 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 um, Blake's Milton. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go to is, is the section that you picked, Plate Thirteen? I could do. Who's gonna? You're gonna read it though, aren't you? 
Uh, do you want me to? I don't, I mean, I could do either. If you want to read it, you can. Well, I've got an Australian accent. Uh, Australian, Drake is the best with an Australian accent. Because it's, <laughs> East, because it's close to East London, right? Yeah, right, yeah. No, you can, you can read it. And, okay, um, uh, let yeah. me do it. Uh, I don't have it here. I should have keyed it up, but I did not. Meanwhile, we can say hello to... Here's Alistair. Yeah, say hello. My my target for the pandemic is to have Alistair make an appearance in every Zoom meeting I have. And really? So far, I'm on a, I've got a hundred percent record. Ah, here's. I always have to show my kitty. Let's see if I can do it. And you'll get like a paint. Oh yeah, there's the ear. Oh yeah. Hey, they could be they could be brethren, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah, not saying that all cats look the same or anything. No, they're all totally different. <laughs> I... la, 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 la. If you're having trouble, I'll just read it out in my... Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have... That's okay. So, um, this is from, uh, so, and from plate 13, depending on how you want to number it um and it's uh in this voices multiple voices that um blake writes in back and forth this is L luther or luetha depending on how you pronounce it i mean there's no correct pronunciation for blakeian names is there so uh this is her in a confessional mode luetha in a confessional mode after there has been so what I think is interesting about leading up to this moment is Blake is an early thinker about division of labor, right? So that there's this notion that each one labors to their own ability, to their own gifts, right? Um, and then there's this satanic moment where um, Satan says, oh, to Palamabron, clearly you're working too hard, I'll do your job for you, right? And it has this really weaselly, passive aggressive takeover of, I can see how tired you are, you're obviously not, let me help you, right? So there's this whole um, criticism, which I think is the whole epic, is about uh, mildness and kindness, right? And there's nothing um, more insidious, and you know kindness and pity and, and I can see how much you're suffering let me help you right so you look tired today right that sort of um phrase or you know I'm sorry to hear you know that you're not coping let me help you um and that's and then there's this moment where this female character Luefa, even though she's had nothing to do with it um takes on the confession so she says it's all my fault Right, and it's because I have been coming in and out of Satan's brain and stupefying him. So there's this moment where um, creepy Satan, you know, I'm 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 going to help you. I'm just here to help. The part of the explanation is perhaps uh, that he's being a little female, right? He's being this sort of saintly character that, that's just there to help everyone out. So that's not Blake. That's me just um, giving the preamble. So in my best um, Australian, which is really very close to East London accent, right? Australian Cockney. I formed the serpent of precious stones and gold turned poisons on the sultry wastes. The gnomes in all that day spared not. They cursed Satan bitterly to do unkind things in kindness with power armed to say the most irritating things in the midst of tears and love. These are the stings of the serpent. Thus did we buy them, till thus they in return retaliated, and the living creatures maddened, the gnomes laboured. I weeping hid in Satan's inmost brain, but when the gnomes refused to labour more with blandishments, I came forth from the head of Satan. Back the gnomes recoiled and called me sin, and for a sign portentous held me. Soon day sunk and Palamabron returned, Trembling, I hid myself in Satan's inmost palace of his nervous, fine-wrought brain. For Elenitra met Satan with all her singing women, 
terrific in their joy and pouring wine of wildest power, they gave Satan their wine, indignant at the burning rock. Wild with prophetic fury, his former life became like a dream, clothed in the serpent's folds. In selfish holiness, demanding purity, being most impure. Self-condemned to eternal tears, he drove me from his inmost brain and the doors closed with thunder's sound. O divine vision who didst create the female to repose the sleepers of Bula, pity the repentant Luifa. Well, that's crystal clear. Yeah, the right. Interpretation needed there, moving right along. That's all you need to say, right? Yeah, goes without saying, right? I don't understand what it means to hide in someone's nervous system. <laughs> right, to hide in their... So here's how, I think the only way you can read this, so um, is, we've talked about in Inheritance, this is Milton, right? And there's the moment in Paradise Lost where um, Satan, um, sin springs out of his brain, right? So sin is something that is monstrous right that you that is uh, that somehow a, a doubling or a doubling of yourself right mm -hmm. and he looks at sin falls in love with sin effectively has sex with himself right mm -hmm. um to give birth to death right and for milton in paradise lost this you fall in love with yourself have sex with yourself give birth to death which will then you'll keep having sex with, I mean, you keep, and then replicate it, right? So why I think it's interesting in Milton, there's this notion of nothing is more evil than just keep turning inward, right? This gnawing on itself, right? Self-replication. And you have in Milton, the difference between good and evil is the difference between good and bad sex, right? <laughs> sex in paradise is with something that's other that's different that you know adam and eve she is uh graceful beautiful right um adam has conversational powers now when blake inherits that moment he repeats right the um pernicious nature of things turning inward so when you say i don't know what it means to be <laughs> you know hiding in something's brain it has this notion of um, things that are self-consuming or self-replicating. And it reminds me, if this isn't too far a leap, and it really is, of there's a tradition, you know, in um, Leo Bassani mentions it in uh, Queer Theory about an anti-pornography. It's sex feeding upon itself, right? It's not reproductive. It's just sex with images, right? Um, it's not real sex. You're having sex with yourself, right? It's pornographic. It's non-reproductive, right? It turns inwards, right? Um, whereas what, so that you're getting repeated in Blake. So on the one hand, you've got a really interesting criticism of the brain, right? That feeds upon itself and its own images. And you've got um, redemption in Milton occurs when at this moment, Luefa says, it's all been my fault because I hid in, hid, hid in his brain and then all you got was replication, right? Um, and that then redemption follows once she's confessed to that and you have another female body, right, that is made and clothed and is outward and different and opens out to the cosmos, right, instead of drawing back into the brain. So I think... Um, I mean, that's one dimension of it. The whole um, critique of kindness, which I think is just uh, another, another thing again, it's related, right? But it's another thing again. But I think these images of the brain in Blake are always about uh, something turn in, turning inward and feeding on itself. Oh. Oh. Okay. Which is yeah. so different than like say Keats and Ode to Psyche. Right. Yes. Sorry to, yeah. Right, and that, that build the fan in, in, in the brain, and I mean it's 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 it's, it's similar in some sense, but also it, it's not about that self feeding mechanism. It's more about like isolation and nerve the nervous system, but not in, in how you described it. So no. that was fascinating. It's different, 
But here's what I think is interesting. It's the same problem, right? Of how you uh, right. want to keep hold of a poetic tradition that has some sort of female muse, right? Um, some sort of female other that, so that the self comes out of itself. But then you're worried that that's just masturbatory, right? And I think that's um, a problem that's, so yes, you're right. It's very different in Keats. It's different in Shelley, right? It's different in um, all these, not in, in Byron's Manfred, right? In which there's the, this appearance of some sort of um, emanation. Um, but the problem is, is it really something that is fruitfully other or is it just turning you back in upon yourself? Um, and that remains the, 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 the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So I'd like to, we're already at like 11, we're already at 30 minutes, but, um, if we could do like a, a couple of minutes of Q and A, is that okay, Claire? Is that totally. yeah. okay? Yeah. Um, and I just like to open it up, uh, feel free either to type in the chat box and I can relay that or, um, just unmute and ask your question that works too. So okay. who wants to go first? Andy already started us off. So thank you. Andy. Yeah. Sorry about that. I missed the, no, don't be sorry. We can raise yeah. your hand and do this and I can call on you or yeah. you want to do that. Okay. Raise your hand. And I'll call you. Allison just typed a question. Yeah, um, Allison, go. I typed it, but <laughs> um, yeah, I was thinking of uh, when you're talking about the like the horror of the non-binary um, and the indistinct and sexual difference. I was thinking of when I teach Blake, the one that I tend to go to is the Book of Thel because it's kind of deceptively simple. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, but that scene at the end with all of the senses, right, just kind of like also coming from beneath, right? Like the subterranean moralism you were talking about. Um, I was yeah. just curious as to like how you read that in the context of what you were talking about. Um, because it's totally fair to come ask someone how to come up with a reading of it. Right. <laughs> um, so, or if you thought about it. I, I, he, I'm going to ask you, like, so here's my, my first response, but I really want you to help me out with it because you've, if you've been teaching it, that uh, what looks in the, the way I, I, I frame the Book of Thel is Blake has this ongoing um, criticism of uh, virginity, right? That there's a tyrannical purity about it, right? Yeah. And so that you get that wonderful phrase that we all use every day, virgin harlot, right? So that there's something... Um, sexually overpowering and tyrannical about you know virginity right and that's that comes in and i think with all the the morality of purity right and moralism right and against that um there would be that as long as as long as one remains in that position there is no life there is no difference right so that um what the book of the the book of tell i read as pretty much a critique if you've got book of horizon and milton of you know cartesian man right enclosed within himself and logic you have throughout blake the female version of that is virginity that's terrified right of any you know or terrified or um just um refusing any sort of sexuality right that, yeah. that's, and so here's what I think is, is problematic. On the one hand, one wants to sort of say, yay, because it has this very anti-Catholic, and I can say that because I'm a Catholic, right? So you can trash your own religion. <laughs> you could say, yay, because it's very anti-Catholic, right? In, it, in its moralism. But it has um, another sort of fruitful vitalist moralism of like go forth <laughs> and multiply, right? Which I think if one knows about, you know, um, Blake's own religious experience, right? That there's a different sort of imperative there. Um, would you want to come back in on that and tell me what you were thinking perhaps in more detail about the Book of Thel? Yeah, that um, I was thinking about like how you phrase it, like the tyrannical virginity, right? Like yeah. the, why a little bit of flesh on our desire. I forget exactly how it's yeah. phrased, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I was just, because I tend to, like myself, when I'm 
and this is why sometimes I hesitate to teach Blake because it's kind of hard to do. Like I'll set up a reading where it's all about Thel kind of refusing to accept like being in a body and being afraid of it, right? Yeah. Um, and the question, the discussion question is always like, why does Thel run? Like, is she a coward or is there something else here? Um, but I was just thinking as you were talking about how like the way that I set up that discussion is kind of replicating this very thing, right? Which well, is the distinction that's, that's, between yes. um, kind of shedding a certain kind of morality, but it's not as if there isn't a morality there that he is also exactly. inscribing in it. So exactly. yes. Um, and I'll probably still never go quite there in an undergraduate class, but it's interesting for me to think about how, and, and I, well, I, I guess it's a larger question because all of us, um, I was listening to you guys earlier talking about how like we introduce these things to students and we have to go from step one, which is you have never heard that Blake exists, right? Yeah. Um, how do we get these kind of more nuanced discussions across, right? When you first have to get over the hurdle of what is this thing even, right? So I was just sort of thinking about that is I have this simplistic reading of Fell that I set up yeah. and I'm looking at it. I'm like, yeah, that's not quite right. And and this is why I think it's a really good thing because in some ways when we teach, we let's say, I mean, my experience of teaching something like Frankenstein, you really want to get them out of the moral reading of Frankenstein. You go like, I've got to get this, you know, more like they got to notice that it's a framed narrative. So you have this mission, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think Blake destroys that um, <laughs> pedagogical imperative in us um, because it's not like, geez, why can't they read this properly? Because the notion of a proper yeah. reading um, either ends you up with a counter morality, which would be something like, you know, David Erdman's Prophet Against Empire, which is a really cool thing to give them, right? And does, yeah. um, but definitely, uh, you know, when you teach it to undergraduates, you do rely on the fact that I'm really hope they don't ask that awkward question about um, like things like sick rose, right? Which yeah. is an anti sort of um, penetration poem, right? Uh, <laughs> something like that, right? And and uh, it's just you know one one relies on them not being too critical about where you're trying to take it with Blake's anti moralism, right? Which is yeah of course, incredibly important. Um, and just as a follow-up, it's interesting, as you two were talking, for me to imagine, even though this is totally anachronistic, but whatever, uh, you know, how Blake would respond to someone who is like asexual or demisexual. Yes! And yes. would he, yeah, you know, like, is that a form of virginity for him? And really, like... Uh, yeah, I think, no, I think it is. So I think, you know, um, the two things that run through Blake are... Um, this is why I think Andy's question is good as because it's it's the same problem, right? Of on the one hand, uh, you have um, a, a movement of sexual liberation, right? That we've got to, you know, I mean, let's be let's be Foucauldian here, right? Um, we need to re liberate ourselves by talking about sex, right? Um, we need to. I need to find who I really am, right? I need to find my interiority, and you have. Um, in Blake, the hell of finding your own interiority, but also the tyranny of the sexual imperative, right? Uh, on both levels, right? Um, and I think the problem is uh, moralizing sexuality, right? Both in the Catholic version, right? Or the Church of England version that he's trying to um, criticize, but also you can't just you know, put a minus sign in front of that and end up with redemption, right? And I think the resources that are there in Blake to say that it's not that, right? Um, and that that's why Book of Thel is interesting because it seems that that's what's going on, but it never quite gets to that uh, second morality. Yeah. That's great. Um, so uh, uh, one, let's try one more question and then we'll end it if, I don't want to, you know, take up too much of Claire's time. <laughs> it's very inspiring for someone to have a question. <laughs> okay, I'll try to ask a question then. But I thought DB would say something before I did. Uh. <laughs> yes, this is. It's great to meet everyone. And thank you, Claire.
Nice to meet yeah. you, yes. It's, it's great to see into everyone's houses too. I love your rug. <laughs> <laughs> I like that orange wall behind you. Um, I'm, I'm looking up, I, I'm gonna kind of connect this to maybe your more recent work. I was kind of going through your titles and I came across one. This is great. I'm scrolling through WorldCat. A globe of one zone in praise of <laughs> flat earth. <laughs> That's like the best academic title ever. Um, how, how do you connect your interest in ecological concerns with your study of William Blake? Well, that's or right. have you done that connection yet? Right. Are you interested in doing that going forward? So that's, um, so it, I actually do think, thank you for that, because of all the things you could have quoted of mine that I just like have completely forgotten about and would like oh, to yeah. um, So what made me uh, write that, A Globe of One's Own, is in Milton, uh, Milton the poet, not Milton the poem, there's all these really good images of this pendant world, something that is suspended and englobed in a way that would be something like the Gaia hypothesis, right? This homeostatic flourishing organism. So you have a good uh, circularity, right? Uh, in which things are constantly proliferating and the more creativity you get, the more creativity you get. And that's how um, we tend to talk about ecological systems and biodiversity. And I think you said in Blake that there are good forms of difference, right? That things that flourish and replicate and move outwards, right? So there's an outward, what would you call that? Uh, cen centrifugal, right? Motion, right? Things moving outward. But then you have this other form of circularity, um, which is, you know, in Blake, when he uses the globe, right, of one's brain, it's an evil turning inward circle. You know, it's a vicious circle that feeds upon itself, right? And I think you have that tied to the globe, like good and bad forms of circularity in Milton and Blake are tied to good and bad forms of sexuality, right? So that you have the Adam and Eve type conversation in which I'm reflected back, you know, it's my own image, but in a slightly different and more productive form, right? Then you have this evil circularity, right? Um, where I'm reflected back. Yes, um, I'm reflected back and all I see is myself and it's self-consuming, right? And I, and I think that this is a good way to diagnose the way we talk about, you know, saving the world. Because on the we're, all we really care about is saving ourselves, right? We don't give a toss about, you know, and globe, global awareness, uh, what is it? Think globally, act locally, think globally. They're really macro narcissisms, right? So, yeah, the, I would tie it back to the sort of the way in which you get good and bad forms of circularity in, in, in Blake. Um, yeah. Yeah. And thanks, Liz. Yes. About turning in. Yeah. And Thank feeding upon itself. Yeah. I mean, why are we, why are we in this pandemic, right? Because of, um, feeding upon species, replications, right, that uh, multiply in proximity, right? Why are we all in lockdown and isolated, right? It's just, yeah. Well, and even your comments about sort of the, the critique of kindness going on here, yeah. like, well, the whole rhetoric around what we're, what we're doing right now with sort of in, in academe and sort of like be, be kind, but. Right, and, and really... also I was thinking of um, my, uh, Trump voting friends that like why can't we all get along why are you so angry right um, that goes with Sarah Ahmed's well, you know like uh, why do you have to you know can't, can't we just have a civil conversation and um, you know uh, that ties into well you know there may be mass carnage over here and um, uh, young black men shot with impunity right uh, but let's not be uncivil about this, right? And we can all get along and you can enter the conversation and I understand and thoughts and prayers, right? Um, there's a, a really horrific um, violence right now with to do with civility, right? And, and pity and, right, I feel for all of you, right? Um, when you, you know, there's the, 
that is a way of just co-opting a conversation and um, removing rage, right? So, yeah. That was amazing. Uh, thank you so much, Claire, for this crazy, awesome time. We look, uh, yes. And uh, we're gonna have several of these um, with right. some of the people in this room. Um, and if you're interested in, uh, in uh, being a guest for William Blake Live, please just contact me and uh, we'll make it happen. Uh, I wanna thank Claire again for doing this. Thank you and so much. Also for, for David, David actually helped with a lot of the organization and uh, the and Romantic Circles pedagogies is is gonna uh, try to get these archived in some way. So um, thanks everyone, and thanks, I will David. be in touch and take care. Yeah. Bye. Word. Disappointments falling to our knees out of habit. The squirrel meets in the wind blown grass, scurries from tree to tree. This is the problem with hatred and love, it does not and cannot see.